Hey, it's Darius, and I'm on the CPA exam Facebook groups every day. And I love reading about when you pass and thank me for I-75. But what do you think is the most common question I answer every day? Which discipline should I take? And here's the answer. If you already passed reg and you enjoy entity tax, especially tax planning for entities, choose TCP. If not, but you already passed FAR and you like random calculations and formulas, then choose BAR, Business Analysis and Reporting. Otherwise, choose ISC, Information Systems and Controls. No calculations at all. Either way, I-75 will have you prepared for all parts of the CPA exam. Just go to i75cpareview.com. We always have a special, so go to i75cpareview.com. Get yourself on the right road with me, Darius Clark, because the right teacher makes all the difference. All right, what about bond issuance costs? Issuing bonds requires expertise in legal and registration issues. So most companies do not have this expertise because they don't issue bonds every day or even every year. As a result, most issuers of bonds incur bond issuance costs because they don't issue the bonds directly to the investor. Companies such as Goldman Sachs often find the bond investor for the issuer. And when the issuer hires a company like Goldman Sachs to find the bond investors, that's when you incur bond issuance costs. So how do we account for bond issuance costs? Well, let's look at this example that we saw in the previous video, but we're gonna add the bond issuance costs to it. On January 1st, year one, the Hertz Corp issued a 10% $100,000 bond due in five years. Interest is due when? June 30th and December 31st. So two interest payments, the yield or market rate is 12%. They give us the present value, 92639 but let's stop and calculate it again. The principal, $100,000. How many periods? Well, it's a five-year bond, but two interest payments, so 10 periods. It's a 12% yield or market interest rate, but two interest payments a year. So we're down to 6%, 10 periods, that's 0 0.55839 times 100,000 is 55,839. That's the present value of the one principal payment to be received 10 periods from now. As for the interest, how much is one interest payment? 100,000 times the stated rate, 10% annual or 5% semi-annual. So one interest payment would be 5% of 100,000 or $5,000. And then we go into the tables. We always use the market rate, 6%, 10 periods, and that's 7.36009 multiplied by 5,000. 36,800 is the present value of all the interest payments. So let's add the present value of the principal, 55,839, plus the present value of the interest, 36,800, and that's 92,639. That's the bond proceeds if there were no bond issuance costs. So notice that we calculate the bond proceeds first as if there's no bond issuance costs, and then we look to see if there are any. And it says bond issuance costs of $2,000 were paid from the proceeds. So as a result of the bond issuance costs, the Hertz Corp will only receive 90,639 instead of 92,639. And yes, they have to pay back all 100,000 when the bonds mature. The journal entry will be to debit cash for 90,639, credit bonds payable 100,000, and then we combine the discount and the bond issuance costs into one account, and we debit that account for 9,361. What's that made up of? $2,000 of bond issuance costs, and what the bond discount would have been had there been no bond issuance costs, 7,361. That discount of 7361 is what we get when we subtract the 92639 from the 100,000. If we were to make a balance sheet right after the bonds were issued, we would have long-term debt principal 100,000 minus the unamortized discount and bond issuance cost of 9361. The carrying amount of the bonds would be 90,639. Notice that we combine the discount and the bond issuance cost. When we go to amortize the discount, we're going to amortize the discount and bond issuance cost at the same time. 
And when do we amortize the bond discount and bond issuance costs? With every interest payment. So let's look at the first interest payment on June 30th, year one. Because the bonds were issued January 1st, year one, and they were 10%, $100,000 bonds due in five years. Interest was due June 30th and December 31st. The yield or market rate is 12%, and the present value, we said, 92639 with a discount of 7361 Bond issuance costs of $2,000 were paid from the proceeds, and as a result, the Hertz Corp only received 90639 They have to pay back 100000 Therefore, this is the new part I want you to see. The effective interest rate is actually higher than the market rate of 12%. So on the exam, they'll tell you, because of the bond issuance costs, the effective interest rate is actually 12.6%. The market rate would have only been 12% if there were no bond issuance costs. But because of the bond issuance costs, the Hertz Corp received less cash proceeds than they would have, which means the percentage cost of borrowing is actually higher than 12%. And suddenly there's a new rate here, 12.6%. So the stated rate was 10, the market rate was 12. We're used to two rates. Now all of a sudden a third rate because the effective rate is actually higher than the market rate whenever there's bond issuance costs. So we made the journal entry, debited cash, 90639 credited bonds payable 100000 and the difference was that debit to discount and bond issuance costs. Now it's time to amortize that discount when we pay interest on June 30th. And for that, I came up with this little table. You don't have to use the table, but sometimes it's helpful. We're trying to amortize the discount and bond issuance costs using the effective interest method. Now, when we use the effective interest method, we determine interest expense first. And how do we determine interest expense? Beginning carrying value, 90639 multiply by the effective rate, which is 6.3% every six months. How do we know? Because they told us the effective rate is now 12.6, so half of that is 6.3. And that makes our interest expense for June 30th, 5710 So debit interest expense, 5710 The cash paid, that never changes. That's $5,000 based on the stated rate, which makes the amortization of discount and bond issuance costs a difference of 710 We plug it. And the all-important end-of-the-period carrying value, we're going to add the 710 to the old carrying value of 90639 and the new carrying is 91000 350. Why is that important? Because when we do December's interest payment, we're going to need the new carrying value. Skip down to the journal entry for June 30th. There's your interest expense debit, 5710. Your credit to cash for $5,000. And we'll credit the discount and bond issuance cost, one account, $710. We plug it. Why are we crediting discount and bond issuance cost? Because it had a normal debit balance and now we're amortizing it. We took the 710 amortization. We added it to the old carrying of 90639 We get the new carrying amount of 91350 That's important when we get to December 31st. When we do the interest expense for December, we multiply 91350 times 6.3%, the effective interest rate. And that gives us 5755 for interest expense. We credit the cash for 5000 and the difference is the credit to discount and bond issuance cost of 755 The last thing the exam will ask with these set of facts is what is the end of the period carrying amount after you pay the interest and amortize the discount on December 31st? And you would just add the 755 to the old carrying amount of 91350 and your new carrying amount for the balance sheet on December 31st, year one, 92105 Notice that whenever bonds are sold at a discount, interest expense is greater than the cash paid. And notice that interest expense for December was even higher than interest expense for June. Why is that? Because we keep increasing the carrying amount as we get closer and closer to the face of 100000 The carrying amount is going up. And what's interest expense based on? Under the effective interest method, it's based on the carrying amount. So as the carrying amount goes up, interest expense will go up. All right, bond issuance costs include which of the following? Letter A, interest payments over the life of the bond. Not exactly. Interest payments are going to happen whether there's bond issuance costs or not. B, 
Fees paid to underwriters and other costs directly associated with issuing the bond. Yes, that's what bond issuance costs are. See the discount or premium on the bond? No, but the bond issuance cost will be combined with the discount or the premium. The bond issuance cost will either add to the discount or subtract from the premium. So C is out. D, the principal repayment at the maturity of the bond. No, the principal repayment is not the bond issuance cost. B is correct. Bond issuance costs typically consist of direct and indirect costs associated with issuing bonds, such as fees paid to underwriters, legal fees, accounting fees, other costs like registration fees directly attributable to the bond issuance process. All right, bond issuance costs should be accounted for as A, a separate asset on the balance sheet, B, a separate liability on the balance sheet, C, as an addition to the bond discount or subtraction of a bond premium, D, an expense in the period the bonds are issued. And if you think you know, leave me the answer in the comments section. And remember to like and subscribe because it really helps the channel out a lot. And if you need more help with bonds or any part of the exam, go to i75cpareview.com. Get yourself on I-75 with me, Darius Clark. We always have a special going, and the right teacher makes all the difference.